I'll warn you from here on down, it's uphill all the way. <laughs> I was already nervous about giving this talk because I have family here. They've already started their criticisms, including why didn't I get a haircut? <laughs> The other thing that you should be warned about, my, my wife says you should find a young person to make slides for you. <laughs> and you'll see why in a moment. Um, but I'll struggle through this as best I can. What I hope to explain to you is how we organized our thinking about the major mental disorders a long time ago, how we went astray in this, and have impeded the development of new knowledge, how we can now come out of that and how the field is coming out of that in ways that offer a good deal more promise to accelerating discovery. So I wanna take you through that story. Uh, Dennis Charney mentioned the small groups doing it and it was uh, way back when I was at NIH and this was in the uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s that we're a very small group of us did think about a different paradigm that would make a difference in the acquisition of knowledge. So I'll speak to that and how that's now playing out in a number of different ways. It's potential conflicts of interest, uh, data safety management board and occasional consultative advice to commercial entities. So the first thing I want to say is just as an overall way of thinking, uh, probably most, maybe all disorders in medicine need to be thought of in a broad framework that involves the social, psychological, and biological uh, stages. These need to be integrated because we're all integrated information where the interplay between these is important. And if this, and the field sometimes has acted as though, like we do work, employment therapy for social and psych, CPT for cycle and drugs for biological, but it's not that all way at all. None of our treatments matter if they don't have effects at all of these levels. So that's just a general framework. So this goes back in history, some of you will know this well, but <clears throat> Kraepelin, uh, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, before that, they're just enormous asylums filled with the mentally ill and no capacity to distinguish what's the matter between them. Uh, the discovery of the syphilitic insanities and, and the etiologic agent enabled the field to remove a group, a large group of patients from the asylums in terms of knowing that they have a different etiology. And that set the stage for Kraepelin, I'm sorry, hit the wrong thing. For Kraepelin to conceptualize dementia precox and manic depressive psychoses as two major psychoses separable from other disorders and separable from each other. And that paradigm is long lasting in our field. And the key components were the dissociative pathology. This would be things like the, the disconnect within thought, between thought and emotion, between thought and behavior, emotion, behavior, the kind of dissociative components of the illness. The abolitional component, which he nicely described as a weakening of the wellsprings of volition that lead to emotional dullness, to lack of occupation, and a number of things that we now refer to as negative symptoms. And he found that a poor prognosis was associated with this diagnosis. And the field has stayed with this dichotomy between the manic depressive, now called bipolar, and schizophrenia as like the two major psychotic illnesses distinguishable from each other. Bloiler gave the name of schizophrenia, and he probably is given the only real hypothesis. See if I can back up. For schizophrenia, schizophrenia being a single disease category. 
and that's his belief that all the cases had the dissociative pathology. So that was the unifying pathology in his view that created schizophrenia as a disease entity per se. Uh, interestingly, hallucinations and delusions were seen as secondary phenomena that were not central to understanding the presence of the illness. This change began to change sometime in the middle of the uh, uh, last century. Uh, this is Kurt Snyder. And he tried to identify what most clearly separates people with schizophrenia from other mental disorders, other psychotic mental disorders. And if you just glance at it, it's a list of what he referred to as symptoms of first rank. These are the symptoms that in and of themselves would indicate the presence of schizophrenia rather than some other disorder uh, in patients. Uh, this became passionately followed by a number of people and with the DSM-3 uh, around 1980 or 81 uh, accepted the presence of uh, a first rank symptom as being sufficient to meet the main criteria that were used in the diagnostic system for schizophrenia, so the presence of one of these. The first thing I want you to notice is the enormous conceptual difference between Bloiler's dissociative pathology, which is not present here, and the reality distortion symptomatology that's put forward as the distinguishing feature. At the time that DSM-3 was about to be born, there was a large problem that needed to be solved. Uh, it was not known whether schizophrenia meant the same thing in different cultures, different countries, different locations. Um, and a very influential study, the US-UK study, and I should say that for the US, it was really the New York City area versus London. Uh, the finding was that research diagnoses done in a systematic way overlapped with clinical diagnoses of schizophrenia very extensively in the United Kingdom cohort. While there was a very large difference with it seeming to be a much broader definition of schizophrenia at play, at least in New York and presumably elsewhere. And this tended to be verified by many of the people with schizophrenia here were also being treated with antidepressant medication. But this seemed to be a problem to urgently solve. How can we identify schizophrenia in similar ways in different settings? So this is when John Strauss, uh, who, who led the Washington group. John Barco was our statistician at the World Health Organization. This is a Nine Nations study of Norman Sartorius. Uh, John Strauss is on the uh, scientific council for the uh, BBRF. So we worked together and we were asked at one time by the then uh, editor of the Schizophrenia Bulletin, what do you guys think you've learned from what you've done? So that's what I want to go through and then the implications of it in the next couple of moments. So we accepted that it, it appeared that we had used a broad definition of schizophrenia in our diagnostic cohort and then the investigators from the other eight centers seemed to agree that we and the Soviet Union had used the broadest definition for schizophrenia. So that set the stage for us to do something. The first rank symptoms that I showed you, and they're also part of what defines this Lang Langfeld syndrome, we had this information in our broadly defined schizophrenia cohort. With it, we could divide schizophrenia into those who meet the first rank symptom criteria and those who do not, or those who meet the Langfeld criteria and those who do not. And the hypotheses would be simple in Langfeld's language, you have true schizophrenia and pseudo schizophrenia. So we have the potential that if correct, we can subdivide our schizophrenic population into these two separable disorders. And the hypotheses around these were very clear. Uh, 
And this is just to say that the developmental history should be different between true and pseudoschizophrenia. And the course of illness after the diagnosis should be distinguishing between them. What we found, and I'm sorry I'm having to click so many times to get it all up there. What we found was that it, didn't make, it did not make any difference whether you had true schizophrenia or pseudo schizophrenia if you were looking at the developmental history. The poor developmental history was associated with both. The poor work development and work outcome with both. An insidious onset in each predicted a poor outcome. The same with the psychotic history, the positive symptoms seemed to predict what symptoms you would have in the future, but did not predict these other elements. So this created the view that the course of schizophrenia is very heterogeneous, and that heterogeneity is not reduced by attempting to isolate schizophrenia into the true form based on the Snyderian first rank symptoms. For DSM-3, when that went in, we had presented this data to the DSM-3 committee. Uh, some of you remember the great emphasis of being based on science. All the experimental data testing the Snyderian symptoms were the studies that we had done and could report to them. And we had also demonstrated that these first rank symptoms occurred in other psychotic disorders, including bipolar. So we think this falsified the main hypothesis that led to uh, the spe specificity of schizophrenia and the belief that it was a single disease entity and the ability to recognize its presence in a person by having a Snyderian first rank symptom. So we took a very different point of view about this. To us, it looked like we were dealing with a clinical syndrome. And just to be clear what I mean between the difference between a disease and a syndrome, uh, you can think of dementia as a clinical syndrome. And if you're studying dementia, you're gonna have a lot of problems because there's gonna be a very, very different causal pathway for her dementia that follows strokes than the dementia of Alzheimer's disease or the dementia of pernicious anemia, et cetera. It looked to us like schizophrenia heterogeneity meant that this was not a single disease category. And we then, I'll show you how we conceptualize a paradigm shift and advocated for it in discovery. So question, is schizophrenia a syndrome with different diseases, the way I just illustrated with dementia? And the alternative with very significant different interpretation would be, think of it as comprising domains of pathology. So instead of having different diseases providing the overall manifestations, uh, this would be compatible with our negative symptoms, a domain present in some but not all people with the syndrome, but merit study in and of itself. Would the cognition impairments be a separable syndrome? Would the motor impairments, would the reality distortion? You could go on and on. But conceptually, this moves the paradigm away from thinking you're studying a specific brain disease called schizophrenia to recognizing that it's a broad clinical syndrome that has to be deconstructed for therapeutic discovery. Now, I want to say some of the progress that is made. So DSM-5 has a couple of small advances that relate to this, and then I want to go through other things that are taking place now. It could be a nice starting point to be sure, keep your interest, is to uh, when Tom Enzel uh, announced the uh, creation of the Research Domain Criteria Project, and he just slammed DSM-5, and uh, later was able to point out to him that DSM-5 was not the problem. It was doing the best we could with symptomatic data. It was not the solution for how you find the mechanisms that are involved in the different aspects of psychopathology. 
And that's what the field in this century has started moving now fairly rapidly toward different interpretations or different paradigms for conceptualizing the psychopathology so that we don't end up with all of our studies being schizophrenia versus normal controls with a range of differences without taking into account the heterogeneity. So back in 74, we, we thought that these were distinguishable aspects common in schizophrenia, different between individual patients with schizophrenia, and not unique to schizophrenia, but important to schizophrenia. Um, a little later, some very nice psychopathology studies done in Spain, and these were eight, some of it overlapping, but eight areas that in their deconstruction they felt were important to characterizing individual differences and the range of pathology that's associated with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. DSM-5 uh, I hope it's a confluence of interest. I was involved in, in sharing the psychosis work group. But if I get all this up here, you'll see. Okay. Should I try for one more? Ah. That was a close call. So we we took it for the DSM-5, we took the position, one, we were made very clear that schizophrenia is not a disease, it's a clinical syndrome. So we tried to establish the view that this is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome, that people working with the psychotic disorders, there are many things you need to know, but this was a brief and manageable list of things you need to know. Does the person have delusions? Do they have hallucinations, disorganized thoughts? You can read these in the cognitive pathology. So these are things that we thought should be routinely evaluated in people with psychotic disorders. And this was done partly because regulatory bodies like the FDA will take guidance from our field as to what constitutes psychopathology. They don't create it or define it themselves. These are more realistic targets for drug effects or neuromodulation effects. So in testing things for clinical application, to say this is a drug for schizophrenia doesn't make any scientific sense. You have to say this is a drug for a certain type of pathology, often useful in schizophrenia, but probably useful for that pathology in some or maybe many other conditions. So this is available for use in DSM-5. Uh, also out of this deconstruction effort, there became a broad consensus in the field that we do not have efficacious treatment for the negative symptom components. We do not have efficacious treatment for the impaired cognition. You've heard some about that earlier. Uh, and we have lost our emphasis on addressing motor disorder pathology related to schizophrenia. I think to save time, because you're very good at asking questions, and I'm probably a good deal better responding to questions than trying to work through my own slides. Uh, I'm going to skip. These are just components of negative symptoms where it looks like you can subdivide it into different components. This is just a reminder that there are many aspects of cognition that tend to be impaired in people with schizophrenia. But I do want to work through then how using a paradigm that deconstructs can lead to more effective determination of the effect or of the validity of an hypothesis. Now, this is a very old slide. Uh, Guvant Thacker, who was at our institution, was actually the first postdoc that Carol Tamminga had while she was there. And this is a slide he gave me several decades ago. And the point of it is to say, if schizophrenia is this heterogeneous syndrome, it's not the target for research. You have to find your targets within the people who actually have, and this is smooth pursuit. Uh, eye movements, this would be another phenotype related to the P50. 
inhibition, but you could put in various things that would represent potential markers for aspects of the illness that are presumed to be present in some, but not presumed to be present in all. And you could say whatever gives you mechanistic discovery for any single one of these could lead to identifying um, molecular targets. If you can identify the molecular targets from a pharmacologic point of view, uh, industry can determine if they're druggable targets. If so, and they create a compound to test for that, you do not want to test it in schizophrenia. You want to test it in the particular individuals they have schizophrenia, but the ones who have the biologic mechanism that has been identified that belongs to a subgroup. So this is, this is simply to say that if you have a drug that treats a component, you test it in the full, you lose it. If you don't know the mechanisms for the components, we don't give industry targets for knowing what the pathophysiology is that they're supposed to address. So this is just an illustration of how breaking it down would do. So now I want to mention several things that are going on in the current era that offer an opportunity to advance understanding by using uh, different paradigms. This is the BSNP program. It's been going on, I'm not sure how long, but probably 10 years or so. Uh, Brett Clements is here, one of the leading investigators in it, and he provided this slide for me. The idea here is that you evaluate, in this case, uh, people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Uh, sometimes they have normal controls in it. Sometimes they have biologic relatives in it. But the point to make is that you can have diagnosis identifying groups. If you put all of these people in the same psychosis group, then do an analytic technique they have different clustering analytic algorithms where you take the information that's available and say, what are the best group solutions? And it will turn out that it's very different in these optimized solutions than it is in the diagnostic categories. And in this example, using a physiologic measure, you now identify a group that's low in the activity, that's high in the activity, and that's intermediate in the activity. The implication for precision medicine is that if, if this represented a pathologic outcome and you had a treatment, you would need some way to identify this group as relevant because the same treatment might have no effect in this group, might make it worse in this group. So this would be an approach where you use new data that goes well beyond the symptomatic data that we use that you use constructs that are derived from the data rather than constructs that are provided from our current nosology. So I mentioned Tom Insel, and he upset the field tremendously when he introduced this. But if it was understood in a very simple and straightforward way, you would grasp it immediately and that this is not a, thre a threat to the nosology of the field. It's an opportunity to enhance our understanding of nosology, but particularly to enhance the understanding of the neurobiology that's associated with specific psychopathologic attributes. And for this one, it started off with uh, five dimensions. We've recently added a motor dimension as a third. And it's to say things like with negative valence, there are people who uh, have a greater response to fear. The fear mechanisms were things that are known about how the brain relates to fear. The hypotheses of associating that with different forms of anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder could be clear. And the paradigm is meant to say as a starting point for your research, choose people who actually have the phenomena of interest and they measure this at a behavioral measure, does not even require that it be identified at a, a pathologic level, that you have a known neural circuitry involvement, and that if you have that, you won't be able to read this very well, 
But this is just to say, if your starting point includes something about how the brain is involved in the manifestation of that behavioral attribute, that it will enhance the likelihood that you can identify gen genes and molecules and cellular circuit involvement, which you're kind of presuming from the inclusion criteria. And this was seen as a, as a paradigm to try to advance a neurobiology understanding of syndromes, and that investigators would be free to choose. You could do this all in schizophrenia, and our group is involved in one that does just involve schizophrenia and normal controls all in the same dimension. But more commonly, you would select, you could select from multiple disorders and find out those that have where they are on this behavioral construct and, and have a starting point with a neural circuitry involvement. I don't know if it's slow or if I should keep pressing. Yeah. This is just to say that paradigm, the shortcoming that has to be overcome, is these are behavioral constructs. So on these behavioral constructs, all of us are on that dimension somewhere. If you think of a dimension of zero to 100, we're all there. How do you determine when this actually relates to symptomatic pathology that merits clinical attention? So that's gonna be the challenge. And this slide is just, and you probably cannot make out the red lines, but there are hypothesized connections between the different RDOC dimensions and different aspects of symptomatology that's associated with psychotic illnesses. So here we would hope to advance knowledge on things like anhedonia. Anhedonia can occur in schizophrenia, can occur in schizoaffective, can occur in depression, can occur in bipolar. We don't know for sure that anhedonia is the same mechanism in all those disorders, but this would be aimed at letting you isolate anhedonia as your study target, ascertain to what extent that generalizes across disorders, and give you a head start on mechanisms because your starting point had included a behavioral construct with a known neural basis. High top, hierarchical, topography of psychosis, not of psychosis, of psychopathology. Um, this slide, don't, don't worry that there's way too much on it. It just is gonna let me make a general point. Um, in the DSM-5 process, a group, mainly psychologists, using statistical techniques with massive amount of information on personality, conceptualized a very different way of formulating the psychopathology of personality um, in the end, the science behind it was very strong. The pushback against it by clinicians was also strong that things like borderline personality disorder, they value it in and of its own right. It's, it's in, in the uh, section three and for more study. But this would illustrate how you use a broad range of data, making ascertainments about what goes with what and how it relates to the development of illnesses over time. And I'll try to explain it by just, I'm sorry, I know you can do it. But at one level, you have internalizing behavior, externalizing behavior, things associated with thought disorder. Uh, at lower levels, you can see how it plays out in different disease categories. But the value of doing this, it's not to just show that we're all internalizing to some extent. It's to determine whether things at this level that can be applicable in populations have a predictive relationship with vulnerability to develop particular kind of illnesses. Um, to the extent, and I'm sorry, to the extent that they've been able to validate this at the statistical level, what's lacking now is to be able to identify at each of these levels uh, how you recognize that it's a pathology that requires clinical attention rather than something that's just occurring in the population. But the implications, and let's see if that's on the next slide. So there are two things. They may help us have better targets for understanding the RDOC behavioral constructs, the relationships with things like thought disorder, disembedded, detachment, antagonistic, internalizing. With these 
features may be stronger than it is with the diagnostic categories. But for me, the most important opportunity, and I probably don't have a, a slide to describe that, is that the risk on these different dimensions applies to multiple disorders. So I, the, the, the talks, uh, Alan, that you and John gave this morning on prevention, I've, I've dropped my prevention slides, I was gonna get into that. But one thing that may help a lot, so if Alan looks at what's associated with schizophrenia, he may find things that are associated with multiple risk for multiple disorders. Uh, it may be that this high top mechanism will be able to find a risk level that's associated with 10, 11, or 12 mental disorders. If so, testing the prevention hypothesis will become much more feasible. Uh, now we see it as extremely difficult to know if you recruit, re decrease the incidence of schizophrenia. If you start with something that happened in childhood and you need to follow people for 35 years to get them through the age of risk and you need tens of thousands of cases, it just seems beyond our ability. I think that if this is successful and associated with risk, it will greatly increase the power of being able to test prevention hypotheses. The other thing going on in our field is, is the attention to computational psychiatry and a new emphasis on large cohorts, the integration of these large data sets and new technologies for assessments. So the people who, I suppose the most ambitious people in this field will indicate that there's so much information on individuals. I mean, just consider for a moment what Google knows about each of us. Uh, one person made the quip, why would NIMH even invest in this that, that Google and Facebook will be so far ahead of you on personalized information. But there is the hope that modern technology assessments will greatly enhance the, what we know about human behavior, including how we conceptualize behaviors that merit clinical attention. And the computational approaches that are based on large data sets will offer a chance to see how nature defines our nosologic categories rather than what we've been restricted to thus far, which has mainly been how we use symptom manifestations to conceptualize our disorders. So I'm close to closing now and want to say this. Therapeutic discovery, and it's been noted by at least, uh, Dennis, you noted it very clearly. I mean, we're, what, 67 years since chlorpromazine. Our antipsychotics are all chlorpromazine-like with some advantage to clozapine that we don't know, but they are using the same mechanism to initiate their treatment effect. We have multiple areas associated with schizophrenia that we don't have treatments for. And there's been the justifiable interest on the pathophysiology of the symptom manifestation or functional manifestations. And of course, this is the hallmark of medicine to try to understand the actual pathophysiologic mechanisms involved in pathology. But compensatory and resiliency mechanisms are critical. There's much that we do in the treatment of schizophrenia that seems likely to try to enhance the ability to compensate for disorder rather than undermining the original pathophysiology per se. And these have been relatively neglected. As far as I'm aware, the, uh, the commercial uh, drug industry is not invested in the networks that are involved in comp uh, compensatory and resiliency aspects to identify targets for marketable drugs. So we may be missing opportunities here I would add to that, and for schizophrenia, what used to be very important in terms of motor pathology seems to have pretty much dropped off the map in terms of developing therapeutics. It's been more how to have drugs that don't create motor problems than to look at the initial pathophysiology that's involved with motor disturbance. This from uh, a CNOP study, which is just one more example, and this goes back to the kind of work been done. 
and this is very similar to one that's been, but this, this, this would just show you that in terms of brain circuits, you can separate those out that are involved with emotional regulation from those that are involved with motor um, and from those that are involved with avolitional components. Now, having complained about our lack of progress, hopefully I've said something about new paradigms that at the moment we can be very optimistic, we'll advance our knowledge and we hope that that comes to play. I do want to say just a quick word or two that at, at the DSM-5 level, uh, that is to say in the current level there are some nice things that represent advances that have clinical application at the moment. And this slide, if, if we were looking at it more fully, this is just to say that, in, well, in the United States, when a person is diagnosed with schizophrenia, they average close to three years since the onset of the psychosis. We know we're coming in very late, and this is just an illustration that if you identify the psychotic process earlier, they're far more likely to respond into a full remission than after it's been delayed. And there's a lot of attention now going on across states and how to identify first episode clinics. Um, anything that we're doing now, if successful, is likely to apply to a minority of patients who are developing schizophrenia. And that's just because our healthcare system for the mentally ill is just atrocious and the resources are not there to treat it with the severity that's present. Okay, then, uh, so, it'll be a good time to stop the prevention. The only, the only thing you're missing, no, no, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm very response oriented, you know. <laughs> so before Bob comes and stands beside me, the, the, the only other one I was going to mention is the work in the clinical high-risk field. Um, and this is where you identify people who are beginning to have sort of psychotic-like experiences that are sort of troublesome, merit clinical care, but have not developed into a full psychosis. There's an enormous amount of work being devoted to that. In DSM-5, in the, in the Section 3, there are criteria, and that's the one slide that had Tom McLaughlin's picture on it, um, would have just said that there are criteria for identifying cases of att uh, attenuated psychosis syndrome. And it, I think most of us, they not only merit clinical care, but there's every reason to believe that clinical care will be more efficacious, including in some of the patients, prevention of a secondary progression to full schizophrenia. There'll be many people in that category that are not gonna progress to schizophrenia anyhow. It'll be heterogeneous. But that's another thing that I think can increase our, the application of our current knowledge. So with that, let's do some questions. Well, well that's a really inspiring and insightful talk. I really appreciate it. And I, for one, want to say that I think the slides were great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm probably in the wrong age cohort yeah, yeah, to be yeah, yeah, yeah. making such a <laughs> comment. Um, questions for Dr. Carpenter? Yes, sir. I wonder if you would explain where you could explain where anosognosia fits in, uh, both in the uh, uh, broader set of criteria that you used. I didn't see the word up there, but also uh, what we can do if there is an early onset, but somebody who simply has no insight into the possibility that they are ill. I, I mentioned the first word you said, where does, did you say where does insight fit in? Uh, yeah, anosognosia, the, uh, the inability to have insight into your illness. Yeah, mm. so uh, insight, and you saw it both in our six, that was one, and in, in the Spanish groups, eight, insight was one. So insight is a tremendous problem associated with schizophrenia, not just schizophrenia, but I think looked at more there. There seem to be different mechanisms at play, so it's not the same thing in everybody. But some of it seems at just at the level of denying of illness. And I think part of it is the brain's processing the way it does for every, all the rest of us. Uh, when I hear your voice, like I know I hear your voice, 
if I was hearing a voice and nobody else could hear it, well, I'm still hearing it. So part of it may be just how they process their experiences and, and put it into their own understanding of themselves. But it creates a problem of knowing if you need medical care. Uh, we think it relates to adhering to drug treatments over time. Um, but there are other concepts of the insight. Um, there would be wide agreement that insight is very important for clinicians to include in their evaluation and in their work. As far as I know, we have very little guidance for what clinicians can do to make a difference in this. Yes, ma'am. Could you relate any connection between autism and schizophrenia, particularly with suicidal tendencies? Um, so there's, there's some things we know. Of course, all, autism seems to almost always be early developmental. In schizophrenia, there are early developmental changes, but they're not as striking and not as uh, severe as is usually found in autism. We know in the, in the GWAS studies that there's a substantial overlap in genetic vulnerability between the two illnesses, and also with some other illnesses, there's this overlap. Uh, in terms of what to do about it and the suicidality, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't, and if, if somebody else knows a good answer, give it to this. I don't know of studies that have contrasted suicidality in the two disorders that point to different approaches to it. And I think generally in the field, we're still stuck at the level of identifying suicidal thoughts, distinguishing them from thoughts that are drawn into plans, distinguishing that from a person who intends to take action on those plans, the kind of the practical things that are done at a clinical level. Um, and we don't know about the different etiologic pathways for those suicidal behaviors. Uh, you did hear, of course, an example of ketamine of a potential new approach to making a difference in the acute suicidal situation. Yes, one more question over here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Carpenter, for, for a really insightful talk and your clearly passionate commitment uh, to those who suffer. My brother has schizophrenia. He's had it for about 20 years. And so I'd like to draw you out a little bit more. Uh, your title says implications for discovery and treatment on the treatment side with these new understandings. Are there, given the current medications that we have, are there new approaches or new combinations or cocktails of medications that we should be thinking about for those who have schizophrenia? Um, so this is a little bit painful to answer, <laughs> and, and maybe I'm too severe on this. Um, we think that the antipsychotic drugs work in everyone, but it varies from working a tiny amount to working. We think that only relates to the positive psychotic symptoms, so hallucinations, delusions, and the thought disorganization. But these other aspects do not have therapeutic response to the current drugs. Uh, there are a number of studies that try to show if you add drug B to drug A, so it's not really proven, but you're almost sure to add side effects. It's far from clear that you can add beneficial effects by combining more than one of these same drugs. You get into combinations that make more sense. For example, if the person has a lot of sleep disturbance, you may want to use a more sedating one at night, or you might have other compounds that you want to use. If the person is experiencing a lot of anxiety, you might add an anti-anxiety. That is to say, you might identify specific things. But so far, for the doctor who wants to make the antipsychotic drug treatment work better. Clozapine is the only answer we have so far. Uh, there's one other aspect that I'll say that we do have a good answer for. Um, the cl and clozapine, which came on as like only for treatment refractory cases, it's probably something that should be used in particularly in this country in a substantially greater number of people substantially earlier because getting a, a, a full restoration of function 
early on is much easier than after this is gone for years. The other big problem with the uh, effectiveness of the drugs is that the substantial population of people with the disorder simply don't take them. Or they take them for four months and then they don't. The long-acting injectable drugs, which can cover for a much longer period, if the person wants to stop, you have a lot longer to work with them because there's a very, very gradual fall off. And that's been badly underutilized in this country. It's getting more attention now. I think it was stigmatizing. It's like you use injectables for people who won't take their drugs or are aggressive. Or it's kind of like there's a bad category. They get it and everybody else doesn't. It should be on the front line that if a person doesn't have a bad response to the oral version of the drug, uh, they're eligible for long-acting injectables. But the main question you ask is part of the complaint. We simply have not done the discovery yet for the drugs. There are a couple that are being explored now in industry that have different mechanisms that might have that additive effect. Okay. I think we'll, we'll have to move on, but I want to, again, thank you for your extraordinary contributions to the field. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. It's fair.